so it has been quite a while since I've done one of these. In fact, the last time I did a video talking about weird, funny Wattpad stories was more than three years ago. I think it was May of 2019. And I've been meaning to get back to this for a long time, but I just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And finally, now, here I am today making fun of weird stuff that people decide to put out on the internet. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Before we get started, I just want to reiterate what I said last time, which is basically, I don't want this to come across as like bullying or making fun of young writers or teenagers who are just starting off because, well, that's, that's no fun. And I wouldn't like it if someone did that to me. So just to reassure everyone that this is all done in good fun, I'm not trying to be mean or any, anything, uh, you can go to the description and check out my uh, old Fiction Press account and read some of the shit that I put there because, oh wait, has it been over a minute? Am I allowed to say that? I don't know, but <laughs> you can read some of the things I put there. Or you can watch the more than two hour long video I made about the book I wrote when I was 15 and see me making fun of it like that. Like, trust me, we were all at this stage at one point. I'm making fun of it, not to berate you, but to celebrate this. So the first story up today is called The Heart Hacker, with two exclamation points, and this one is completed. And what's the description? This story is where ASR is famous as a heart hacker. He's very much popular in girls, whereas Kushi is dangerous. Five friends in ASR team. They are famous as hackers, and where, as in Kushi's team, five friends famous as dangerous divas. How these two tackle with each other. This is what the journey is, and then like three ellipses in a row. I don't know about you, but I have no idea what that's saying. Maybe I'll understand it better when I start reading. Uh, chapter one, or sorry, hacker one. College, what to say about college? College life is that part of our life that we are going to relive in our memories till we breathe. <laughs> Has you really been far, even as decided to use even go want to look more like? We're two sentences in. <laughs> it's a colorful life, and for girls it's something we can't express the emotions. They are butterflies in the campus. College is the place where we live our life to the fullest and make lifetime best buddies. Can you please stop using the word life over and over again? Who can do anything for friends? Experience the college life and enjoy. You are pawns in the first year. Dot, dot, dot. You are ministers in the second year. Dot, dot, dot. You become the king of campus in the final year. First day of college, we build a lot of dreams. Some students come to college to achieve success in their life, give better life to their parents. Some students come to college because of parents' pressure. And the third category, students just come to pass time, but they are spoiled brat. But every rich family student, not a spoiled brat in this category. Our story hero, the Arnav Singh Raisada come. Am I having a fucking stroke, man? <laughs> oh god, the first time I read this, it was like midnight, and I had no idea if I was just so tired that I was starting to lose my ability to read, or if it really was just written this way, and it was. You know, um, I'm not gonna keep going beyond that, because I, I read the first couple of chapters, I have no clue what's going on in this story at all. Like, there's some people with Indian names, I believe this is supposed to take place in India somewhere, and I, I don't think this author speaks English very well. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, I don't want to just make too much fun of this or sound mean while making fun of it, so I, I want to give a little bit of credit for whatever it is that I think was good in all these stories, and for this one, I'm impressed that, one, you were able to complete it, which is more than a lot of people can do, and two, I, I like your confidence, whoever wrote this. I, I like your ability to read over this and go, yeah, this is good. I can, I can put this out into the world. This next one is called The Opposite of Falling Apart, which I will admit I do like that title. That is a good name for just a cutesy teen romance story. It is about a boy named Jonas who lost his car, or lost his leg in a terrible car accident. <laughs> That's a much bigger deal than losing your car, I think. And a girl who has terrible anxiety, and I guess they fall in love or something. Let's find out. Okay, so you open it up, and the first chapter just says to purchase the opposite of falling apart, because apparently this was actually published. So let's go to the second chapter. Oh, the second chapter just says, important, please read. 
and this one is also just a long message from the author asking you to actually buy the, the copy of his book rather than just reading it for free. Uh, and then we have a dedication or foreword for part three. Okay, it's dedicated to all this, and then we have a whole long Spotify list of songs the author listened to while they were making this. Okay, there's a copyright notice. Okay, part four. Uh, starts with hashtag free your body. This story, this story is part of the free your body campaign here on Wattpad. Okay, dude, we are four parts in. If you had all this stuff that was really that important, just put it in the first part so we can get to the actual story. Like, I'm, th this is apparently a paid story, which is a thing now. I didn't realize Wattpad had made that a thing, but that's because I don't really go on there that often. And... I guess there's only like 15 free parts, that's the preview, and after that you have to pay for it or something. And like a third of that is just a bunch of messages from the author. Jesus, man. Okay, so we get to chapter 5, and that's where the actual story starts. Jonas. Jonas had done two things when he'd come home from the hospital for the first time after the accident. He'd taken a sharpie and scribbled out the lower half of the left leg on his Bones of the Human Skeleton poster that had hung on his closet door since fifth grade, the first time he'd decided he wanted to be a doctor. That's pretty extra, Jonas. Number two, he'd looked at the newly altered poster and cried for the first time after and only time since. He was looking at the same poster now. Okay, so, um, like many, many Wattpad stories, uh, this one just starts off with the main character getting ready for school which doesn't seem like the most exciting way to start off your story. Like, even if you're writing something that's more character-focused, like a romance, wouldn't you want to start off in the middle of something more important rather than just, hey, here's me getting dressed, and here's me driving to school, like, wouldn't you? So we have a long conversation between Jonas and his mom, where his mom tries to cheer him up, and he pretends to be cheered up, but he's not actually cheered up, and a Apparently, he lost all his friends after he lost his leg in the car accident, which is a strange thing to think about. Like, did, did all his friends just decide they didn't want to be friends anymore with the kid who has one leg? What? Huh? He withdrew from everyone. Jonas with two legs had never been incredibly social or popular, but he'd had friends at least. Your friends are dicks, Jonas. In fact, this whole first chapter is just a very long description of Jonas putting his prosthetic leg on, and then getting ready for school, and then driving to school, and then Jonas gets to school, and that's how the first chapter ends. I just, uh, I'm, I'm riveted. And I think we're just gonna stop there because I'm not really into it. The thing is, this video is not for making fun of mediocre Wattpad stories because there are countless numbers of those. This is making fun of the really, really bad ones, because, I mean, even the really bad ones are obviously a step in the right direction, and they help you get better as a writer, so good on you for not just putting in the effort, but putting it out there. Uh, but, no, no, I just, I don't have the energy. <laughs> that one was just a weird way to start off, but hey, yeah, like, he completed it, he got it out there, and... I mean, like I said, if the, if what you're looking for is a weird, or maybe not weird, but just a cutesy high school love story, I'm sure that one is fine. Ooh, we also have one called The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. What? This... Oh, okay, this is literally just the text of The Time Machine that someone copy-pasted and posted on Wattpad. I don't know why, I mean, I mean... This isn't illegal because, like, the copyright expired a while ago. H.G. Wells has been dead for a very long time. But they also posted several of his other books on here and a couple of other long classic books. Like, why exactly? I don't know why someone would go to the trouble of doing that. So, if you saw my original video years ago, you probably remember that I had a segment where I talked about how there was a weird number of stories on here involving... Muslim teenage girls falling in love with non-Muslim white boys, and I thought it was really weird and funny, and hell, even before that, I made a video on probably the worst one of those called Muslim Next Door. It's a, it's an old one, but it is a very funny one. And I asked people, why is this a thing? And the way they described it, it's just like a harmless 
fantasy for girls to have. And, like, okay, sure, fine, whatever. It is a little weird to me, but, you know, kids are allowed to have their fantasy, they're allowed to have their outlet, and it doesn't really feel like they're fetishizing white guys or anything. I mean, e even if it was as your friendly neighborhood white guy myself, I don't particularly care. Like, as far as that sort of thing goes, it's pretty... I guess wholesome is the best word for it. And I mean, the fetishization does kind of go in the opposite direction as well, and it's considerably... Well, it's a lot less wholesome when that happens. Uh, yes, that's, that's all real, by the way. I don't know why that's a thing. If anyone has any theories, let me know down below. But anyways, the point I was getting at here is that I thought, well, clearly, teenage Muslim, gr Muslim girls are not the only minority that would have weird stories about this sort of thing. So I started thinking about what other sort of tags could I type in here, and I typed Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, there aren't as many of those, but <laughs> there's still a fair number. In fact, pretty much all of these seem to be about gay boys falling in love. I mean, okay, nothing wrong with that. It is a little strange when you remember the Jehovah's Witnesses views on that sort of thing. But let's look at one called Your Voice is My Favorite Sound. Oh, oh, sorry. This one is called Two Boys Fall in Love. Sorry, I, I looked at the cover and I saw the big text there and I assumed that was the title of the book. How silly of me. Plus, Your Voice is My Favorite Sound is a much better title. Chapter 1. Malachi, my mother knocks on the door. Malachi, get up. You have to get ready for field service, she says, only walking away when I start stirring in bed. I groan and stretch as I open my eyes for the day. It was Saturday. Uh, again, another one where he's just waking up and getting ready for... Well, I guess it's not school this time, but he's getting up early, getting ready for an event. So the whole first chapter is just them at church, and it's described in exacting detail. I'm not getting into that. Uh, and then... It ends with an author's note where the author says, Thanks for reading, and how he wants to write a book about a queer Jehovah's Witness leaving the religion, and how he's really excited to get through all this, and then the, he only uploaded one other chapter, and he hasn't touched it in two more years. I think we're just going to skip over the other Jehovah's Witness romances, and uh, let's go to the Mormon romances. This one is called Wrong Number, and this one's also completed. So, again, good on the author for that. It was written by... 2129887HB. This one is about a teenage girl who accidentally somehow gets a hold of the number of a teenage boy and starts texting him, and then she spends all her time trying to convert him to Mormonism. I'm, re I'm really not joking, that does seem to be the majority of what happens based on what I read, and granted, I only read a couple of chapters, and it's, uh, oh, 35, including the epilogue. Chapter 1 Nick. My phone dinged and I looked at it, expecting a text from one of the girls I had flirted with at the party earlier. Okay, that's a good way to start, I guess. My head was ringing from all the alcohol I'd consumed and I wasn't in the mood to read a bright screen. I pulled my phone out of my back pocket of my jeans and squinted at the name on the text. Like, okay, first you're not in the mood to look at a bright screen and then you immediately look at a bright screen. Okay, I know show don't tell is a cliche, but have what you're telling match up with what you're showing. Because this is just weird. And then, I don't know, we have a couple more sentences of him looking at his phone, and then it cuts to Stacy's POV. Again, if you're gonna start off with a character, have something interesting happen with that character, rather than have him just look at his phone, I'm drunk and hungover, and then put his phone away, and then cut to the other character. And this is where... Stacy actually is texting him. Like, she apparently thought she was texting her friend Jen. Jane. Whatever. I don't care. All the Jens should be Janes anyways. Wrong number. Oh, sorry, is this not Jane? Nope. You her boyfriend? No. Sounds like it. You literally said, I hope you made it home safely. I'm worried. Please, that's a friend who is genuinely concerned. Dude, that's the friend zone. And th this actually just goes back and forth for quite a while. It's just... It's dialogue that the author clearly thinks is cool, or is at least intended to sound cool, and it doesn't work, it just comes across as boring, and when it goes on for too long, it's, uh... I don't want to use the word obnoxious, but it's really obnoxious. And, like, if you had just cut it down significantly, I think it would have been fine, but it just, eh, it's annoying. And plus, we keep switching back and forth between Stacy and... what's-his-fuck, I don't care what his name is, but... 
it keeps switching back and forth between them. And the way that this is formatted is that all of the received texts from the character whose POV we're looking at now are on the left, and all of the uh, sent texts are on the right, so it's like an actual phone conversation, which is pretty good in my opinion. Like, I think adding that uh, visual element to it does help. But the thing is, because we keep switching back and forth between the characters, it's hard to tell who's texting who, or rather who's who, when you're reading through the text conversations, and it's kind of annoying, but let's get to the part where she tries to convert him. Who goes to church anymore these days? People who still believe in a god. Oh, she only said a god, she didn't specify which one. I'm gonna worship Kali, can I still be in the LDS church? What's the point? The world seems pretty wicked to me. God hasn't done crap in years. Maybe for you. How was it? Church? Fantastic. You should have been there. You might have actually felt a little bit of the Holy Ghost with that hard heart of yours. And, yeah, it, it goes on for a little while. He calls her a Mormon. She gets upset with him calling her a Mormon and says, you should call it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm not doing that. Like, they, I'll, apparently some of them don't even like when you abbreviate it as LDS Church. Like, I, bro, it's a long name. I'm not saying the whole thing. And she basically tells him, hey, you should come to church, you should read some of the Book of Mormon. And then she goes off on a surprisingly long tangent where she explains the whole story of Joseph Smith finding, like, the golden plates and how he first wrote the Book of Mormon, which um, I'm not going to go too deep into right now, but they had a whole South Park episode about that, which rightfully made fun of it. <laughs> the Book of Mormon says a lot of strange stuff, like that Adam and Eve lived in Jackson County, Missouri. Yeah, I think we're going to bail on this one because it's really just every chapter uh, is a lot of talks about what is Mormonism like and does Nick want to become a Mormon? And they're just texting back and forth. Neither of them has their actual names yet. Or neither of them actually knows what the name of the other one is yet. Uh, yeah, I guess it's a little different. I'll give it that. Like, you know, it's hard to come up with a teen romance that doesn't fit into all of the exact same tropes that we've seen a million times on this godforsaken website, but still, still, it's, um, it's not great, but hey, I can tell there was effort put in. Oh, here's one that sounds fun. The cover is just a blank white page, and it is called Pornhubbed, Ethan Dolan, in which a boy finds a girl from his school on Pornhub. Oh no. So the first part of this book is just a list of characters. It has, a, I don't know what's going on here, all of this stuff, there's some weird text problems going on there, just says Pornhub has a couple of pictures of people, I assume these are actors that are supposed to look like the characters in the book. Okay, let's go to part two. Natalia! And that's just more pictures, and more pictures. Okay, not showing that on YouTube. And then Ethan! Okay, it's the same thing, just pictures of yeah, yada 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 yada. Okay, can we please get to the actual story thing? Why is this such a common thing on Wattpad? Why, why must they make me scroll through a million things just to get to the beginning of the story? Why don't you just frickin' start it, guys? Advice to all writers, just start when you get the chance to start. Okay, so we finally get to part one, which is told from Ethan's POV. I burst into my room and kicked the door shut behind me. Dinner was finally over. I finally got to relax. I jump on my bed and kick off my shoes. My back relaxes into the soft mattress, my eyes slowly shut. I took a long deep breath and long breath out. I was finally getting some time for myself. And oh, okay, nope, we're uh, <laughs> we're not reading that in detail. Um dude looked through Pornhub for a bit and then he finds a girl who he went to school with and sees that she had a couple thousand views on a video where she was doing sexual things. We're not going into the uh, details of that, but you know, she was doing sexual things. So let's go to chapter two. So again, chapter two is Ethan getting ready for school and then going to school and then being distracted because he can't stop thinking about the girl, Natalia, and how he saw her naked on Pornhub. And then he finally finds her and apparently she's like a smart, nerdy girl. I, I don't know why that was needed in there, but okay. She, she's like a smart, nerdy girl, and she thinks he's gonna tell her to do his homework, and then instead he tells her about... Well, well okay, we have to go to the next chapter before he finally tells her about, hey, I saw you on Pornhub, and she's like 
surprised and aghast at this, which makes me think, girl, were you not expecting this? We're, we're, seriously, like, you're putting it out there with, like, your face on it and everything, and you're surprised that someone found it? Like, I mean, it's not okay for him to, like, mistreat you or anything when he sees that, but at the same time, if you were worried about that, like, blur out your face or something, Plus, I don't think you would make that much money putting yourself on Pornhub anyways, but I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert. This one is called Love at First Sight, but sight is spelled S-I-T-E, yeah, like, a, like a website. It also has, like, an actual cover, which says that there was effort put in here, and it is complete. It's not a long story, but it was at least completed. Lauren Jarugi would have never imagined meeting someone online who could stimulate her like she's never been stimulated before intellectually. But she did. She meets Camila Cabello as she reads comments while waiting for a video to buffer in the most unlikely site, Pornhub. In this age of social media and technology, can two people find genuine connection, share meaningful conversations, and bear their souls to someone they met online, especially one which starred with a random porn video in the lesbian Latina category? Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't read this one. I just went through the description there. And I kind of refuse to read it, partially because, like I said, this video is not about fan fiction. This video is about original fictions. And, you know, I have a whole separate series for bad fan fictions, which I also haven't done in a long time. But anyways, this one involves at least one real person, Cam Camila Cabello, and, um, that's creepy. Okay, like, it's already strange that people will, like, write themselves falling in love with real celebrities and everything. And... Like, that's weird when it's kept PG and wholesome, but if you're gonna make, like, actual porn of a real human being that did not consent to that, that's creepy. And we should stop doing that. And it's all over the internet, quite frankly. I realize that probably no one's going to... Probably no one's gonna listen to me, but still, can we, can we please just... Let's, let's not. Let's not make porn of Camila Cabello. She, she did not ask for that. There's a non-zero percent chance that she sees this, and, uh, I apologize. I I'm sorry I had to be the one to bring this to your attention. I'm a fan of science fiction, so let's see what kind of sci-fi offerings they have on Wattpad. We have This Alien Soul by Ashley Brooke, or Ashley Cash 123 Whatever. I mean, again, this, this one's complete. Good on you for actually completing it. When Amber was just an infant, an alien spaceship crashed, crashed in her small lake town of Mountain Lake, Georgia. The aliens were isolated, a large settlement that was heavily guarded to protect the citizens of Mountain Lake. Now with Amber's senior year starting, the decision has been made to start integrating the aliens into the community. Amber knows she should fear the Zion alien, Alec, who has started in her class, but instead she feels an instant connection. Soon everything she thought she knew about herself and her world changes. Will Alec be the rock she can cling on to? This is just the plot of Starcrossed. Like, y'all remember that? That was a CW show? from like 2013 or 2014 it had literally this plot some aliens crash landed in in the american south as well like because this one's apparently in georgia and starcrossed was in louisiana and then uh some alien kids start going to their school so that they can be integrated because racism and civil rights allegory and then the main human girl starts falling in love with the main alien boy like that that's literally the same plot. Chapter 1. Prologue. I thought I knew pain. From the stabbing, radiating pain to the kind that produced a dull throb that refused to go away. I had faced it all and lived through it. Excelled even. Forced to grow stronger from it. I thought I knew suffering, but I was wrong. This took it, this took it to a whole nother level. A pain that was eating me from the inside, setting every cell on fire. What's going on? I... okay, we're just... Uh, yeah, whatever. There's like a weird dream that the main character's having, her name's Amber, and she's in pain in her dream. And then she actually wakes up, and you'll never guess what she's doing. She's getting ready to go to an event. This one's not school, it's actually her last day of summer vacation, so she's getting ready to go to the beach with her friends. Here, here's an idea for everyone out there. If you feel like starting your story off with the main character getting ready for school, or church, or anything else, just have it start with them already there, at the event. Like, th this could start with Amber already at the beach, or it could start with them already at school. And then, 
whatever important thing is supposed to happen there can just happen. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Like, maybe I'm harping on this too much, but after reading through dozens of these things, trying to find good material for this video, these specific tropes, these weirdly specific tropes, just started standing out more and more and more, and it felt like tax being shoved into my eyeballs. But the important part is that while Amber is getting dressed, she's listening to a radio broadcast, which gives a bunch of exposition for us to hear. Anyone old enough remembers that night just over 18 years ago, when the Zionian spaceship crashed down in the small town of Mountain Lake, confirming once and for all the existence of life outside of our planet and shaking our very foundation. She said in an overly dramatic tone, not that she was old enough to remember, she would have to have, she would have had to have still been in diapers. Couldn't they have picked a more seasoned reporter for this gig? No one could remind us more than those who lived it. The camera panned out. I thought she was listening to a radio broadcast. Uh, a minute ago she was listening to a radio broadcast. Now apparently she's watching television and the, there's a camera and she can see things. Okay. And then they talk to a man with an exaggerated southern accent, where he says, I was sure the sky was falling and it was the end for us. There I was, getting ready to cut into a juicy steak my Mary had just finished grilling up for me. And you know it's that, because whenever a word ends with ing, it's just the I-N and apostrophe, like he's not pronouncing the G. Which, it's not that there aren't real people that talk like that, it's that if this is a small town in Georgia, I feel like most of the characters should be talking like that. I don't know, That that's just me. It. I feel like if you're going to do that thing either have most of the characters speak with that dialect where you actually show it, or excuse me, most characters speak with that accent slash dialect where you actually show it, or just put in description, most people talked like this, and that'll, that'll be it. And then uh, it's just, you know, some more exposition of how the aliens crashed 18 years ago, and how they're gonna go to her school tomorrow, and they spend a very long time going over this, like, there's an interview with the mayor that lasts like half the chapter and the interviewer is just going over it with him and it, like, okay, I get that if this was a real interview, they'd be going into a lot of detail about it. But it, again, th this is a book, this is fiction. We don't really need to go beyond the surface in most cases. You can just say like, yeah, the aliens are being integrated into our school so that they can become more closely aligned with human society or whatever. And then we get, like, some of the main character's thoughts on it, and that's good. And then, um, we also find out that Amber is apparently undergoing chemotherapy for some sort of autoimmune disease. And that's not what chemotherapy is for. Chemotherapy is for cancer. Like, chemo actually, it, in a way, it kind of is an autoimmune disease. It makes your immune system weaker, which is why people who are undergoing cancer treatment are at such high risk for things like covid and I understand that she's just putting in, like, okay, the main character has some sort of unspecified illness, and I just want it to fit whatever the plot demands, so I'm not gonna make it a real one, and I'm not gonna give it a name or anything, it's just gonna be vague and made up, which is totally fine, I think that's, that's alright. But, Jesus, Jesus Christ, at least you gotta match it up a little bit. And then she goes to the lake, and, oh well, it actually takes until... Chapter 2 before she goes to the lake, but, you know, like I said, chapter 1 is always reserved for characters getting ready. And from there, it's pretty much what you would expect. Like, she runs into alien kids at school, and she starts thinking about how, oh, I don't know if I like aliens, but she's not super racist or anything, and, eh, like I said, th this one's not bad by any, any real stretch. Like, I, I think the opening part... If, if we're grading on a curve here, the opening part is perfectly fine. It just does make me chuckle a little bit that this is the exact same plotline as Starcrossed, and that was a terrible show. But at the same time, uh, Ashley Brooke did finish this Alien Soul, so again, good on her. I, I know I keep saying that, but I do want to hammer it in. Like, if you have the fortitude and the determination to actually finish something, then good on you. I'm glad you could do that. There's a couple stories I came across that I refuse to read, but their titles and covers are just amazing. So we've got stuff like My Pet Mate, which was in the werewolf category, or Pregnant by My Abusive Husband. <laughs> I know that's not I, I know that's not funny, but <laughs> come on, man. We've also got Mermaids and the Vampires Who Love Them. Oh, that sounds fun. Let's check that out. Everyone knows mermaids and vampires can't date. 
but when a mermaid ends, ends up at a boarding school with a smoking hot vampire for a roommate, will love take a bite? So this one follows a mermaid girl named Waverly Fishwater. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I, I kind of love that name, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I feel if you're going to uh, just be kind of silly and dumb with this sort of thing, just go all the way with it. Like, like just name your mermaid Waverly Fishwater. Name your vampire Blood Bite Man. Just be, be fun. Have fun with it, man. Chapter 1. My life is ruined. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Honestly, I can't believe my parents are making me change schools in my senior year. I love South Pacifica High, where I'm the captain of the water polo team, a champion diver, and head of the debate team. Okay, actually, reading back over this, I'm very confused, because we find out not long after this that she's a mermaid, and therefore she lives underwater, and her, her school presumably is also underwater. How could you be a diver if you're already underwater? How, do, how does that work? Because normally diving is where you're, like, high above the water, and you do, like, flips and shit, and then you crash into it in a specific way. How does that work underwater? And again, water polo. How does that work underwater? Like, I, I, okay, sure, I can accept that to a lesser degree, but underwater water polo, where the people can breathe underwater, would be significantly different than regular water polo. I was lying on my hammock in my underwater bedroom cave, weaving seagrass into a basket for charity and daydreaming about Finn reef crafts. <laughs> Perfect Torso and Bad Boy Grin. I love the names in this. I, I love the names so fucking much. This is amazing. Uh, when my mom swam past the heart-shaped fissure in the wall of my bedroom, the last thing I wanted to do was endure another interrogation about why I wasn't doing the algebra homework, so I rolled out of my hammock to hide underneath. That's a... There's a lot of run-on sentences here. Basically, her parents tell her that, hey, we're going to this other school with a bunch of other non-human monsters, and I think in this world, just non-human monsters are publicly known and they just live in society so like mermaids and vampires and shit just live amongst humans i i don't know maybe i'd know more if i read through the whole thing but i'm not doing that partially because again this is paid and partially because this isn't meant to go over the entirety of most of these stories it's meant to just give you a little taste of them and then there's a whole bunch more exposition but this is particularly obnoxious because it's parenthetical exposition like it'll just be Waverly, Mom said in Telespeak, and like just that one little line, and then an entire paragraph explaining what Telespeak is and how that works, and I, I don't think we needed that. You could just say, Mom said in Telespeak, and if you really needed to, you could put in like one line saying, oh, hey, we can't talk when we're underwater, so we use telepathy. Like, you, you can just do that. I feel like a lot of people, especially a lot of uh, early writers, are simultaneously very afraid of exposition and feel like, oh, okay, if we put too much in there without anything really happening, we're going to bore our audience, so we got to be careful about how we do it. But at the same time, they just are not really... Uh, they don't have much confidence in their audience's ability to pick things up from context, I suppose would be the, the neatest way to put that. A general rule is just that if you really, really need to put some exposition in, especially if it's really early in the story and you're just trying to draw your audience in, uh, it's better to put that in, like, the narration or in a character's inner thoughts as opposed to someone speaking it out loud, especially if it's exposition they should actually know. And I should probably get back to this werewolf, or sorry, not werewolf, this vampire mermaid love story. Like, there's enough werewolf stories on Wattpad to just read until the heat death of the universe. It has its own category. Like, you know, we have uh, categories like fantasy, contemporary lit, LGBTQ+, romance, poetry, thriller, science fiction, and werewolf is one of them. Like, there's a lot of these things. But anyways, uh, they meet a character named Shelly Sharkweather, <laughs> which I didn't need to tell you, but I, I wanted to because it's it just, I love the names in this so much. Like, and again, this, this seems like a perfectly fine story. Like, if you're looking for something of this nature then you probably already know if you're going to like it or not. But it is it is pretty funny. Like, let, let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. If you're like the writer or a fan of that type of thing, let's be honest with ourselves. It's pretty silly. And of course, who can forget about that particularly weird subgenre of Wattpad teen romance where teenagers not don't just fall in love, but they're also involved in underground fighting rings. 
because there are a lot of those, that, like just a weird, weird number of them. Uh, we're going to look at one called Bulletproof today, but I just really want you to know how many of these things there are because there, there's so many. When Franny learns why former popular boy Tyler fell from grace, she gets thrown headfirst into his dangerous world, but also closer to his timid heart. Oh, cool, we have to skip past the first chapter again. And then, oh, okay, there's a chapter two, which is also just talking about how the book is actually getting published. And I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy for you, Tolly Purvis, but can we please just put that all in, like, the front bit? Can we please? Okay, so now we get to the prologue which is told from Tyler's POV. Everything is much slower in the circle. It feels like time itself just stops and gives me the chance to finally see for the first time. It's in these moments when I notice the things that can change the outcome of this fight from losing with a bloody nose to winning with a swollen eye. I prefer to go with the latter. Y yeah, Tyler, I, I, I think most people prefer to win when they're in some sort of competition. I first see my opponent. He's large, bigger than me, and has the stance of a bull. He's ready to charge, but isn't adaptable enough to be able to veer off once his direction is decided. And it, it like it goes on like that for a little while. The uh, prologue is actually just this whole fight between Tyler and this other guy, and apparently his nickname is Bullet. Or at least I think it's saying his nickname is Bullet, because it says he moves like a bullet. And I will say, normally I would recommend not starting off with a fight scene, or at least not starting off with a long fight scene, because... We don't know these characters, we don't really care about them, and when it's not in a visual medium, it doesn't work super well. Like, it, if it's in a movie or something, then we can just see, oh, okay, they're hitting swords, and oh, that guy rolled over, and that guy got stabbed, whoa, it's crazy. But if it's in a book, then it's just kind of, he hit him, he hit him really hard, he moved out of the way, he kicked him in the shin, and he was in pain. Like, it, normally I would say to avoid that. However, this prologue actually does it in an interesting way, which makes it work in that the actual action itself doesn't take up that much of the focus. It's mostly just inside Tyler's head, and it shows him thinking about it and thinking about how he's going to react and how he's going to fight. So we get an idea of what sort of person he is, and, well, we actually start to grow and know him as a character a little bit. And I did like that. That's a clever way of getting around that problem. So then we go to chapter one, which is told from the other character's POV. It's Franny. I don't know why so many of these stories that are romance feel the need to constantly swap back and forth between the two leads. Like, I don't think we need that. You can just have it follow one, but I mean, whatever. And this one does not feature Franny getting ready for school, but in fact features her already at school. So the important events can just sort of happen and we don't have to build up to it with a bunch of exposition. Good on you, Tali Purvis. I have no idea how to say that, but good on you. So Franny is upset because their teacher is giving them a pop quiz, and she's like, oh, I don't want to take a pop quiz. And she's also talking to her friend Tally. And this is where we learn that Franny is kind of a bitch. I squint a little at her choice of nail polish, noticing how the pink clashes completely with her bright ginger hair and pale green eyes. I thought we made a unanimous decision about pink not really being your color, I say in the nicest way possible. Tally glances at me from the corner of her eye and she slouches in her seat, knees up and pressed against the front of the desk. I ran out of the red and you know that I barely have any nail polish, so I had to go raid my mom's drawer, otherwise I'd start biting my nails again. You should write a book about it, I snicker. Fifty Shades of Pink, the brand new erotica by Tally Archer. What shade will they use today? Like, jeez, girl. You, this is your friend, apparently, that you're talking to like this? Okay. And then we go through, like, Franny and some other characters and the teacher talking. And the problem is that every character kind of talks like the writer's idea of a cool person. Like, we got Francesca. I hope you took my advice and started to study your notes every night. It will do you a world of good. Of course I have, I say with a smile. Every night I've been right on it. Well, then this quiz will be sure be a test of your studying abilities, and just, you know, things like that. It's like every line of dialogue is intended to be like a snappy comeback or something. And, I mean, having that once in a while is fine, or even having one character who talks like that is fine, but when everyone does it, one, it becomes a little difficult to tell them apart, but two, it just all becomes this mush, like this mushed up 
soup, I guess, of dialogue where everyone kind of talks the same and we don't get any personality from it. And then finally, Tyler comes in for, uh, into the class and we get a weird description of him. It, maybe it's just me, but this one seems weird. His hair is dark, almost pure black, spiked on top, then tapered in his back. His skin is pale, but not white enough to make the pinkness of his lips appear too bold. Uh, okay. And then we get some more, like, cool person dialogue where we learn that Tyler is, like, an edgy, cool loner. Which is weird to me. Like, when I, when I hear the name Tyler, I don't think edgy, cool loner. I either think of my brother, who's a computer programmer, or I think of, like, those kids we went to school with who wore a hoodie when it was 80 degrees outside. You know, like, when I think, when I hear the name Tyler, that's what I think of. But, okay, like, th this is basically just the introduction to Tyler, and we learn that Franny doesn't know him super well, but she knows of him and kind of feels sorry for him, and is like, oh yeah, that guy's kind of weird and brooding and edgy, because, you know, Tylers are edgies. And, I mean, uh, I guess I'll just end there. I don't know if the actual romance is any good, but like I said, that prologue is pretty well put together. If, if you're gonna start on a big fight like that, do it uh, where you're, like, in the character's heads or something similar to that. As a brief palate cleanser, I want to talk about a story on here that I genuinely liked. It's called Storm by Caesar Vitale? Vitale? I, I think that's how you say that. And this one is about a storm which just started in Los Angeles and it's been raining nonstop for about six months by the time the story begins. It flooded out and killed most of the people there and destroyed all the infrastructure. So there's very few survivors left and the few survivors left think that there are like weird phantoms go walking around in the rain killing people. And okay, that, that immediately caught my attention, I will admit. Uh, and then we just have two separate storylines. There's like a storyline with a character named Mary Lou and another girl uh, named Amy. And then the other storyline is a kid named Dean and a couple of his friends at a pizza shop. And their storylines are both interesting in their own way. Like Mary Lou and Amy are hiding out at a school and then all their food gets stolen and uh, Mary Lou's pet snake dies. And I felt weirdly sad when that happened. It was only a couple of chapters and the snake was barely in there, but I still felt weirdly sad when that happened. And they decide, okay, we need to go off and uh, get out of Los Angeles because we have no food. There's barely any survivors left here. We, like we're gonna die if we sit here for too long. And then Dean and company are also getting ready to pack up and leave. And my only real issue with this is that every chapter goes back and forth and they're not very long chapters. So we get like a little bit with the girls and then a little bit with the boys and a little bit with the girls. I would say just combine like two or three of the chapters for each one if you're gonna go back and forth like that. Uh, but the biggest problem I have with Storm is not that it has an unusual apocalypse because I like unusual apocalypses. It, you know, the, the idea has been done so much that coming up with a new idea is like credit, eh, something I wanna give credit for on its own. My biggest problem is that this has not been updated since June 28th, 2017. Yeah, we got, we got 11 chapters and then Caesar Vitali just stopped writing five years ago. Uh, and his profile hasn't been updated at all since then, which I'm disappointed by. Uh, like, if Caesar sees this, uh, please continue, because I actually like this story. I, I want to see it. I want to see it completed. Of course, if we're talking about teen romance, we can't help but talk about bad boy romances. And, I mean, of course, that goes for teen romances and adult romances, because, you know, shit like Fifty Shades of Grey and 365 Days, that, that's bad boy romances. We've got one called Taken by the Dark. Taken by the Dark what? Oh, oh, okay, it's a mafia love story, that's cool. Yeah, there, there's a shortage of those. Jesus Christ, I, I don't remember the name of the woman who wrote 365 Days, but she should be put up for war crimes because of the amount of dark mafia romances we've been seeing ever since that book got big. We've also got The Nerd Who Cried Bad Boy, and the woman on the cover is just straight up Selena Gomez. Uh, okay, what's the description? Alyssa Hart, a 17-year-old nerd who is brutally bro bullied by everyone in Lockwood High. Marcus Sawyer is the hot 18-year-old bad boy, former gang leader who is very popular in Lockwood High and around. He has been arrested a few times and dated almost every girl he laid eyes on. 
Bullied all her life, Alyssa decides to put a stop to it by lying and saying that she and the bad boy Marcus are dating. When Marcus finds out, they make a deal and both decide to stick to the lie, which benefits them both. Getting popular by the minute, Alyssa's high school life is what she had always wanted, popular and wanted. But Alyssa learns that dating a protective, attractive former gang leader comes trouble, and she must face the consequences. Okay, some grammar issues, obviously, but again, this one was actually completed, so that that's nice and all. And this one starts with a whole long spiel about no more bullying, because who wants to read when they start chapter one, and then chapter two, it's a, a cast, and it has, like, all the characters, but also, like, actors that they imagine the characters as looking like. So there's obviously Selena Gomez as Alyssa, and then some generic white pretty boy as Marcus, another generic white pretty boy as Sam, and another generic white pretty boy as Kendall, and so on and so forth. Let's move to chapter three. Okay, chapter three is where it actually begins. Every learner in Lockwood High shouted and cheered as they took videos and or pictures. Amanda, the girl I gave a sarcastic comeback to, punched me again and again. I wanted to cry, but if I did, I would be doing everyone a favor. Well, what sarcastic comeback was it? I mean, okay, I'm, ju I'm just happy it doesn't start with her getting ready for school. She lifted me up and dropped me back to the floor, and I landed on my butt. I winced in pain and tried to block my face from getting be beat up. Get up, bitch, she hollered at me. Shouldn't I be calling you that? I answered and chuckled. The audience oohed and awed, and Amanda gritted her teeth. Boys, she said, and three boys came from the crowd, and each one held my limbs. So... Amanda just, like, has minions that that she can summon at will. That's that, that's a nice power to have. So everyone in the crowd is super mean to Alyssa. They're pelting her with food and laughing and taking pictures as she gets beat up. And eventually class starts and they all have to leave. And then she cries. And then even as she's walking around the hallways, teachers, kids, and janitors passed her by like she was invisible. Um, okay, that's a weird one to me. Like... Even if the bullying was going to be this extreme, somebody would care. Like, especially teachers and stuff. Like, I know that they talk about how the teachers are mean to her as well in this, but that's just... that's just stupid. In addition to just not being very realistic and yada fucking yada, the main problem with that sort of thing is that when you make something too melodramatic, then you don't really have anywhere to go uh, for the actual big, serious story moments. Like, I hate that I have to bring this up again, like, having to bring it up at all is too much, but if you remember in Stones to Abigail, which is Onision's first book, uh, the story, the world that the story takes place in is so goddamn over the top and so melodramatic all the time that when big events happen, like the school shooting, they don't even mean that much. They just kind of happen and then they're over very casually. And if your story starts off with the main character being bullied this bad, then you don't really have anywhere to go from there. And then Alyssa gets beat up again in the bathroom by a brunette girl named Jenny. And then she gets beaten up some more, and then she gets yelled at some more by the, the teachers and the other kids, and everyone's so mean to her. And then she runs into Marcus, and Marcus is nice to her, so she decides she likes Marcus. Like, the... This is every incel's wet dream, let me tell you. Just being polite to a girl and suddenly she's in love with you. And then, of course, there's The Devil's Mate, which is about a girl who loses her family in an accident and then falls in love with the devil. Which, I suppose, if you're going to be in love with a bad boy, there's no boy badder than the devil. Badder? Baddest? I don't care. If you're going to be in love with a bad boy, the devil's a good one to, to choose. My name is Allie, and I'm 17. I go over to my friend Amy's house all the time, and almost every time I go, we play the Ouija board. This time I want to do it at my house. Let me explain. My mother, father, and little brother just died in a car accident two and a half weeks ago. After their accident, I became a bit of a shut-in. Someone came to my house and told me I had inherited the house, my parents' small fortune, and their life insurance, including my brother's. Okay, but you're under the age of 18. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't there be some sort of custodian of all that for the next couple of months? The funeral is when it actually hit me that I was alone. I cried all night, until I had an epiphany remembering Amy's Ouija board. So naturally, I texted Amy. Hey, um, I know we haven't talked in a while, but could you come over with the Ouija board? She replies instantly. Are you fucking kidding me? With like, 18 exclamation points and question marks. That's the first text you send me in weeks? Okay, um, Amy, her entire family died in a horrific accident. 
If this is supposedly your best friend, couldn't you cut her a little bit of slack in that department? So the rest of the chapter is just them playing with the Ouija board, and then something happens and it looks like Amy is getting possessed, and then her eyes turn red with blood, and apparently she's possessed by the devil, and then this happens. Hello, Allie, a deep male voice says through Amy. The entity touches my fingers with Amy's. They are ice cold. It's so nice to meet you, my love, he says huskily and smiles with Amy's face. Who, who are you? His smile falls a little. A demon, but I won't hurt you. Okay, but why is he already in love with her? They've never met. This is their first meeting, as far as I'm aware, so why is he in love with her exactly? So then after this, uh, they go through a very, you know, romantic first meeting where he takes over her friend's body without consent and then says some weird stuff and tells her, okay, I'll let your friend's body go if you just go to hell with me after you die, and, uh, she agrees to it, and her friend Amy doesn't remember anything, and then two years pass and nothing happens, and we're just gonna stop after that. Like, I don't think there's anywhere to go from there. See, that one commits to the cardinal sin of having, like, kind of an interesting setup, but just being really boring in execution. You know, it, again, it doesn't start with the main character getting ready for school, at least, but it, uh, it, it does just have them going to school a lot, and the whole Ouija board thing could have just been one chapter rather than two, but whatever. Serialized fiction sometimes has weird pacing like that. From what I read, at least Allie was ac properly freaked out that the, the devil, or some demon, or something, was actually showing romantic interest in her, which is... You know, you should be freaked out if that happens. Just saying. Okay, we're running a little low on time here, so the, our final story of the day is going to be My Neighbor, My Boss, and an Incubus. Wait, uh, I'm sorry, is that supposed to rhyme? Uh, like, My Neighbor, My Boss, and an Incubus? Incubus? My Neighbor, My Bus, and an Incubus? Yeah, like, that doesn't work. It feels like it should rhyme, but it doesn't. So I don't think I can read you the description without getting demonetized, uh, basically. She moved into an apartment next to her new boss, and her boss is an incubus, so he has a lot of sex all the time. And then we get to chapter one, and I literally cannot read you any of this chapter. Like, it, it starts off with uh, the main character just being annoyed that her boss is having very loud sex in the, um, in the room next door. God, I hope they hurry up and finish as I groaned into the pillow from the frustration. Yeah, that's about all I can read to you. Okay, can we, ladies, can we please stop making the word daddy so sexual? Can, can we just stop referring to your sexual partners as daddy? It's weird. Or at least, if you're gonna do it, do it in an unusual way. Start calling him Pop. You know, give it to me, Pop, like that sort of thing. Just have fun with it. Yeah, I wish I could read you more of this, but like, there's, there's nothing I can, <laughs> there's nothing I can go in there for. Uh, I'll, I'll give it credit that it goes all the way with its subject matter, though. And, like I said, that's, uh, that's gonna be the end of this segment, uh, for today, at least. I don't know how long it'll be before I do another weird Wattpad story video. Maybe I'll just, hey, if I find, like, one specific really weird one that I can go into more detail on, maybe I'll have fun with that. The main thing I noticed while I was looking through for a lot of these is that they will come up with these, again, crazy ideas, but then they'll portray them in a mundane way. And I think part of that is that they don't really know any other way to do it. Like, so many of these start with main characters waking up and getting ready for school or some other event because, well, that's just how so many other Wattpad stories begin, that when people read a bunch of them, they forget that, oh yeah, I can do this in a different way. So my main advice to anyone who's trying to make it as a writer, whether you're on Wattpad or just in general, would be to branch out, you know, read stuff not just in a variety of genres on this website, but like read more regular books, read manga, stuff like that, you know? Anyways, uh, Wattpad, it's always a fun place to find teenagers with no shame putting their dreams out into the world. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye. Huge thank you to everyone who watched this far. Uh, I'm sure everyone who's leaving a comment telling me to kill myself uh, definitely made sure to watch the whole video. Uh, so thanks to them as well. And all the names you see on screen right now, these are my patrons. So thanks especially to my super ultra great patrons who are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Evie, Flax, Great Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, 
Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Matthew Bodro, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Robbie Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Cillier the Vixen, Tesla Shark, Vavixis, Vavictus, and Wesley. I'm not I'm not redoing that. I don't even care. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to get your name on here, be sure to join my patron page. If you can't do that, then please just rate this video and comment on it, subscribe, all the things I'm supposed to say here. Um uh thank thank you. Goodbye.